On Sunday, May 22nd, the Nande Historical Society held the second part of our Remembering the Flood of 72 series. The first segment of the program was presented by Juliana Smith and covered the Mount Morris Dam during the flood. The video of that segment is available on our Nunday History YouTube channel. This second and final segment covered the flood along the Kashiqua, and it was presented by Tom Cook. Okay, if you're new, this is part two. How many were here for part one? Okay, how many of you saw part one on the video on YouTube? Okay, all right, because it's up there. And so we'll be adding this. And so you saw part one, and part one worked Whiskey Bridge, Portageville, Letchworth, um, and you can see the video. And so I'm going to do along the Keshequa, and there's some, it was a really interesting challenge. And I'll tell you why through the program, okay? Okay. We've seen in the last one, and you saw today, the, the immensity and the power of, of the river and the waters and the flood. And so you can see that this clipping, in many of these clippings, we don't know what the newspaper came from because the people just clipped them and didn't write that on. The wild waters of Keshequa Creek. Okay, now for those of you who are not familiar with the Keshequa, it starts down in Allegheny County and it comes through the town of Portage, Nunday, Tuscarora, and then joins the Canisareca Creek at Sanye. And it has a drainage area of 76 square miles, supposedly. And it's the largest tributary to Canisareca Creek. So it's a, it's a major, it's a major uh, a little waterway in itself. So we can imagine that there would be quite a bit to tell about the flood. And so the Nunday Historical Society, what we have done, because this is the 50th anniversary, is we wanted to document this because we know that it's 50 years, a lot of the older people that experienced it, the moms and dads that experienced it, they're, they're gone. And we had some of the children last, last week, or at the first talk, telling their stories uh, from the time period. So we wanted to capture for Nande along the Kashiqua area, we wanted to capture those memories too. And immediately, I started to run into trouble. Well, there's a couple of things that made this challenging. And one is, comes right out in the Nande News, the week after uh, the flood, that Nunday escaped the brunt of the flood area. And it reads, if you, if you can't see it from where you're sitting, although heavy rain for several days last week caused flash floods in the surrounding area, Nunday escaped virtually unharmed except for many flooded cellars, leaking roofs, and broken tree branches. A few people had to be evacuated from their home. So there was just not physically as much damage, not as much as we saw in other places throughout the southern tier and Fillmore and, and Portageville and such. And I think, and it's my theory, that this had, it has almost muted the psychological response. I'm not sure if that's the right way of saying it. People don't have this burden in their memory for two reasons. One, it wasn't as bad, but for families suffered from it. There was damage, okay? And there was, there was like, they knew they had friends and family in Portersville. They were close to people in Portersville. Fillmore, along the flats, Southern Tier, everybody had somebody in those areas that got completely destroyed. Because look at, this might have been Tib Smith. This was a Dalton correspondent mm -hmm. in the Nunday News on June 29th. Any remarks I might make about the flood would probably be very insignificant. Dalton suffered plenty of inconvenience 
overtaxing of sump pumps and services of our willing Nunday Fire Department. But who could even wish to complain when we knew of the great losses and suffering, suffering all around us? Our public utilities remain working throughout and we're everlastingly thankful to have been so fortunate in this little area. So I think in, in some cases, we're not seeing a whole lot of stories coming out because people felt those stories were insignificant with what other people faced. But there's still stories to tell. Okay? Oh, I got to add something else. You saw the Monday news? We rely on the Monday news to provide us background on everything local. So the flood, they would publish on the 22nd, and they did publish, but it was already printed, so there's no flood information. 29th, that was the main article, the one I showed you the headline for. They went on three weeks vacation. <laughs> there's no newspapers over the next three weeks, and the next one was July 20th. And by that time, a lot of the stories and the headlines and things were gone. So this is the Cachapool Creek today near Oakland. So I went hunting in Portage area for stories and pictures of the flood. Now, the, the Graham Farm and the Patridge Farm are in the town of Portage, but I'm talking about along the Cachapool. Well, the people told me, essentially, they thought about it a little bit, and they said, it wasn't too bad. In fact, they remember some flooding along the Creek Road in Oakland. In fact, one gentleman, Phil Cox, thought some logs from the Slauson Sawmill on 70 broke loose, got carried by the flood against the bridge, but according to everybody's account, the bridge stood. You know, that didn't flood. There was flooding here and there. And, and one gentleman told me that there was a place called Oakland Hotel. Not far from, not far from his house, this is Phil Cox, on Creek Road. And the Oakland Hotel was actually a pull-off place. It was like a little peninsula of land where the local kids would drink and have little campfires and stuff. Is some people re remembering this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, and evidently, evidently the flood, the flood took out the main area that uh, made up the Oakland Hotel. It was no more after that. Now, I'm sure that the kids found a new spot somewhere, but uh, it wasn't there. But it, it, the, isn't that a beautiful, this is off the bridge in Oakland, and that's what it looks like on a quiet day, when you saw a picture of how rough it was then. So let's, oh, and, and in Oakland itself, there's a little creek by the old liquor store, do you know where I mean? Now that overflowed a little bit, but there was no damage except for some cellars in through there, uh, according to some folks who lived along there. And I want you to help me if you know a story from Oakland, if you remember some other uh, stories from the dam, from the destruction of flood, something got flooded out, or other stories for uh, Oakland, or any of these, I want you be, to be sure to fill out one of our memories worksheet because we're not done with this. We're going to keep collecting information and hopefully people in the audience will be ready to share it back with us. So, now the town of Nunday, and it goes through the town and the village. We were able to find a little bit more information thanks to the, the town clerk, Tammy McCollum. Uh, she found the initial special board meetings one for the town of Nunday and one for the village of Nunday. Okay, so let's take a look first at what happened in the village itself. Uh, Leon Goldthwaite, you remember him? Oh, yeah. He was mayor at the time. And they met the 29th, now that was about a week <coughs> after the flood. And there were some county meetings that they decided to go ahead and send some folks to. 
And they reported um, some of the damage pretty well. The land washed away from the uh, school playground, bus garage, near the home of Margaret Barber. <coughs> Margaret Barber. I'm waiting for you to tell me exactly where Margaret Barber, Barber was. Nobody? We'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't find it. The Walnut Street Bridge was closed due to damages. The, some of the um, tree debris took out some of the foundation of the bridge and they had to close it. There was much debris along Crooked Brook Creek, which is one of the two tributaries in the village that come in, uh, east, on the east side of the village. There was damage of the impounding reservoir on Chitsey Road and the estimated cost to repair, and I found this to be very interesting, was $919. Now, why that's kind of a, a funny figure for it, um, but that's what they came up with. And this, to me, was really interesting. Upon the advice of the principal of the school and officials, they drew many old cars onto the banks of both sides of the Keshequa behind the school, then drew in gravel to cover these. Do you people remember seeing that? No. They did it um, up near Pump. They did they, the same thing on the Keshequa, well, off from Route 70 along that bank up there between the cemetery and. Uh, no, where you turn the now, old was that, so that was in response to the flooding? They did the same thing, the old cars and covered it up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Wow. Still there. Rodney, what were you going to say? They did the same thing along the Genesee, uh, coming down the Genesee, down the Mudville area. There were cars along mm -hmm. the bank. I had heard that. Yes. Cabled together. They cabled them together and then filled, them, filled it in to do it. Yes. Now, I wonder if people in the village were missing cars when they were <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they must have had, they must have had old ones. But I didn't realize that there, wouldn't they build a dike? Is there a dike at the school? No, it's just like refills the bank that washed away. Okay, and just filled it in? They wiped the bank out, they filled it back in. I see. Okay. And we do have a picture of the, that bank. Now, the pictures that we have uh, in our collection here, we don't have any idea of who took them. They were, might have been, since they were big um, 8 by 10 black and whites, it's the type of thing that uh, the village probably had made or maybe the police made. This looks like it could be off of the Main Street Bridge or the State Street Bridge, South State Street, maybe looking east. But it could have been off, even off the Mill Street Bridge, okay? That looks like State Street to me, because this is probably the sign for Water Street here. So you can see, and we don't know, there's no date or time on this. So we don't know if the waters were coming up at this time. I'm guessing that that's the case or they were going down. Pretty, pretty heavy. Now remember, this is before they've come through and did the lining and the work that they've done since this time, which has made improvements in the channel. You see that the banks are pretty low. There's not a lot of room for the water to rise. There's one at the school, okay? So you can see this was taken from the Water Street place, and, and of course people remember this as being uh, the playground back in here, on there, and um, this, that's the gym, the 71 gym, uh, which would only have been a year old. At, Were the tennis the courts there then? Pardon? Were the tennis courts there then? I don't know. They would have been, I think, over in here, wouldn't they? Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to say. They've moved them a little. And this is the bus garage. Okay. And they're looking from the back of the school yard, turned uh, and looking toward the southeast. Um, 
church, South Church Street's over there, there's Water Street. And so, you remember when that was the main bus garage? Uh, and you can see how much it had cut in. In fact, there was some actual flooding in the bus garage itself. That looks like silt and water. And that looks like on the outside doors. It looks like the buses are in there. It looks just on the outside. This is nighttime, so my guess is this is among the highest, where the water was the highest. Now, this brought up another problem. We have had, to tell you the truth, worse floods in 72 since that flood. Ours, the big one for us, really, people talk about, you remember the flood of 2003, that's when we lost the new gym floor that had just been put in with the second new gym. But, so, because flooding was a common occurrence in Nunday, since it was founded way back in pioneer times, it's hard to sometimes to sort out pictures and memories of some of these floods. Some people I was talking, I talked to, had said, "Yeah, I remember that the the water was coming way uh, on uh, South Church Street, and it was coming up that way because the things were plugged and it, it destroyed the new gym floor and the thing." And then we said, whoa, wait a minute, that's the wrong one. But they, they guys kind of got wound together, and that makes it difficult. This is a wonderful picture of flooding on, um, south, on Mill Street, where the Keshapo Creek crosses. But we don't think it's the flood of 72. No, not the car. <laughs> OK, the car, and look at the trees. It was June, late June, and these trees are just, gosh, I don't know. They, are they just starting to bud out? Looks like it. But, um, so, this, that presents another problem. However, this is a wonderful historical record. Now, there was flooding in Tuskegee, and I've got a picture of that in 40. I wonder if this could be 1940, do you think, Gary? I don't know what year that car is. No. I, <laughs> I think that's the only way you could really mm -hmm. trace that at, at all. But, but these houses are still there. Yeah. These, these are there. But you can see how low that, that's, if you drive down Mill Street, you'll see that yeah. there is a dip there, and that would bring about more flooding. And this is looking on the north side of Mill Street. And I'm not quite sure it looks like they turned around and shot up toward uh, the square on this. This may still be Mill Street. Um, but see, there's another problem. Many of our photographs are back on other floods. And as you all know from your own family photos, people don't always date the photos. And it makes it a little tough sometimes unless you can pick up some clues. Now, this one is probably the flood of 72, but I'm not sure of exactly where this was taken. It looks like that same bank that was eroded behind the school, but that would make this in here, the peanut back of the peanut butter factory and things, the school over here, this, that doesn't look right. Uh, so this is probably in the village, but I'm not sure where it is. It's with the other pictures. Anyone want a chance to guess? Could that be the old casket factory? Uh, I'm not sure if it's turning. That was my thought, too, Would that be the right here. Monday Lumber Yard in the uh, I'm not sure. Would the creek do a turn like that on that side? Okay. But as I told you, we're still in progress trying to figure these out. Now, I want to stop for a minute and, and mention, and I was thinking a lot about this last night. The fire whistle went off last night in the middle of that storm. The winds and the rain and things. And our firemen went out and took care of several different things. And it just reminded me how wonderful our volunteer fire department is and how in times of disasters, 
they're there. And this is a picture from, uh, they're working on the Patridge Fire, I believe, in this one, um, on the Nunday Fire Department. But we saw in that same headline that I showed you to, at the beginning, this was in the Nunday News, that the Nunday Fire Department recorded several hundred calls for assistance in pumping out water out of cellars, and there were some ambulance calls during the emergency making their trips to hospitals by roundabout routes. Mm -hmm. Telephone mm -hmm. operators were extremely busy. Remember them? Telephone <laughs> operators? Yeah. We used to have them. Were busy with calls. Circuits were most busy most of the time, so it was difficult to complete long distance calls. However, the operators remained calm and courteous and tried their best to get emergency calls completed. Such a disaster calls for calm cooperation and everyone in the area seemed anxious to do whatever they could to alleviate the suffering and supply assistance to those in need. Well, they did my grandmother's cellar. Ever and if you've had your cellar flooded, you know that's no small little thing. No, but, yeah. um, the town, the, the town was interesting. Um, discussions was held on damages. Robert Blood, they moved to um, borrow 5000 as a note to enter in a special emergency disaster fund, and everything would come out of that fund. But they estimated uh, that, would, that would work until they get a federal grant, and they estimated the damages at a quarter million dollars. Now, can you, can you guess what is going to be the most costly thing in town repairs? You are like seventh graders. <laughs> Bridges. Pardon? Bridges. I didn't, well, Bridges. Bridges. Bridges and road, because of course that's the main thing that the town takes care of are the roads. And we have a whole maze of what were dirt roads, not state or county roads, to, to take care of. And they uh, did apply for the federal funding under Federal Disaster Act. Now, the reservoir was under the village care. That's what cost evidently $919 to <laughs> fix. Um, and it's more it's, it's, it's the spillway. If you went out in 2003 when it happened, it was a little more than this, but this is, reminds one of that. But of course, that meant that if that water was coming out of there, it was coming down Chintzy Road. And it certainly did. Again, we're looking at pictures that if they were in color, they could have been 2003, because you know the heavy damage uh, which actually was a little worse along Chitsey Road at that time. Anyway. And then there were a lot of back roads, and you notice a lot of them, they're not much more than seasonal. And most of it was gravel, dirt roads, but they had a lot of sluices and things in them. And just the damage, and these are from small drainage creeks. This is in the Keshequa. And of course, we had the Kearney Road. Now, I have been trying to gather information from people who remember these things. And the people who have been coming through for me are some of my old students and um, who were pretty young back in 1972. Ben Carlson, do you know Ben? You know the Carlsons. Uh, they lived on uh, Barkertown Road at that time. And he wrote, he remembered this in elementary school. He said about this picture, that was just a few hundred feet down the road from our home at the time of Barkertown. The flood lifted a large sluice pipe out of the Kearney Road just behind where the photographer was standing. And there's that sluice pipe making the road impassable for the better part of the week. Back then, Kearney Road past our, past our home toward Highway 436 was a seasonal road. 
So to come and go until the sluice was repaired, we drove down through the corner of Roger Cox's hayfield to reach Barkertown Road. People are, are very inventive. And this is a cute one from a kidner gardener in 1972. Because the high school kids had, were finishing up Regents. Um, but you remember the elementary kids had to go almost the whole time? And this is from uh, Val Vili Griffin, our town historian. She writes, in June 1972, I was a student in Mrs. Carolyn Hark's kindergartner class at Kesha Central School in Dalton. At that time, kindergarten was a full day with instruction in the morning, then lunch brought by Mrs. Marsh in a plug-in buffet cart, followed by an hour or two of nap time before dismissal at 2.10. Carolyn Piper Hart was a 1953 graduate of Nunday Central School, as was Joyce Werner Howard, Mrs. Hart's teacher's aide, who graduated in 1945 from Nunday Central. I remember that it was overcast and rainy for several days toward the end of school. One day, Mrs. Hark had us put our heads down on the table. We sat six to a round table rather than lay down at the cots. At one point, I sat up and noticed the fire door was open and Mrs. Hark and Mrs. Howard were outside scrubbing the cots and leaning them against the wall to dry. The last several days of school were half days for elementary students. One noontime, we were on a bus coming home. Bertha Yaw Terry was our driver on bus 34. We came down off Shoot Road and turned right onto Kearney Road and she stopped the bus. Water was rushing over the top of the sluice and across the road. Rock and debris from the hill had rushed downstream and plugged the sluice. Finally, we very carefully ventured across and dropped off Marie Burley and turned around and continued along the route. I don't know if the bus drivers of today would have gone through that. <laughs> the next day was the last day of school. Mom didn't wake me up that morning, and when I went downstairs and looked at the electric wall clock, it said 4 o'clock. I kept watching for the school bus, but it never came. I just had to go to school to get my report card. In kid fashion, I whined about my report card all morning. Finally, in a tone of voice that told even a six-year-old that she was done discussing the issue, my grandmother told me they would mail it to me. My report card came in the mail in July. On that last day of school, I remember it was very dark in the house and it rained all day. The electric came back on at 4 p.m., exactly 12 hours later. I remember thinking how peculiar that was because we didn't have to reset the clock. Dad tells me during that time period we drove to a location on Pennycook Road where we could do, look down into Portageville and watch the water washing over the top guardrails on the bridge across the Genesee River. I honestly can't remember this. Dad says that it was a warm spring and everyone had put their gardens in early only to lose them to a late hard freeze. I remember it was wet and humid well into late July and August, but I also remember a dry spell toward the end of July. Dad was able to bale hay, and later Mom drove the tractor where Dad threw bales onto the wagon and also stacked them up. Life returned after the, after the flood. This is Bailey Road, and the damage concentrated is about around the flues. And this is the Bailey Road. And these small dread creeks that were draining the fields and things did a lot of damage. Myers Road. Wildcat Gully Road. The bridge, there's no pictures of the bridge and no mention that there was any damage uh, to the bridge of Wildcat Gully. The, so the town records are mostly about um, the roads. But there was also farm fields. The Coles mentioned that they had some land uh, across down by the creek in there that had suffered from the floodwaters of the Cachaqua on there. And this picture appeared in a newspaper that's a clipping 
but it's looking north through the old iron bridge at DeGroff Road, town of Dundee. And the caption through this for this was written by Reverend Harold Estes. Oh, where, oh, where has my land gone? That's the song that Howard Galton is singing, singing as he looked at his land and discovers that five acres of prime flat land along the Kashiqua has just about disappeared along with some giant walnut trees and all of the rest. Looking through the bridge on the DeGroff Road to the north, one views the very great changes that the great flood of 72 created in the land all through the northeast. What had been a small peaceful creek became a mad and angry running torrent. The power of some of this has been beyond description. Man stands helpless before the forces of nature. No wonder that primitive man respected the lightning and the thunder and gave verbal interpretations to them. In spite of all our technologies, we are still subject to the forces which are beyond our control. This is, this is a word that one hears over and over again from old and young alike as they gather up the pieces and think about the evenings in late June of 1972. Now we're going to head down to Tuscarora. Because Tuscarora is a little community that lives along Cachapo Creek. that you see right there. And this is the main street. Now, I asked, Doug Morgan has been very helpful with this. He has done a lot of history work. Uh, his grandparents ran the store in Tuscarora. Um, and he helped him put out to the Tuscarora folks that he knows words about, can you help with this? And they also posted some flood shots but this is the flood of 1940. It's a little difficult to see, but it gives you a good idea of what a flooded Keshequa would look like. But I couldn't get other photographs of the flood of 72. And I think we'll find out why in this story. This story comes from Kathy Maston Renita. Her mom ran the post office in Tuskegee. And she, she says this, I was 15 years old and living in Tuscarora with my parents, older sister, and my younger brother. I remember my parents conferring with the neighbors, May Barber and family who lived across the street, and Cliff and Arlene Halpenny and family who lived next to us. It rained all day and I remember firemen going from house to house in the afternoon telling everybody that we needed to leave our homes and get up on one of the hills surrounding Tuscarora. Authorities were afraid that the railroad bank on which, which was right behind our house and Halpenny's house could break away and all of Tuscarora would get flooded. We had a small camping trailer, and the Halpennies owned the farm up on the Mount Morris Hill going out of Tuscarora, the old Frank Ronecker farm. It was decided that my father would pull our camper, camping trailer up to the farm and park it, uh, park it so that there would be a sort of base camp for anybody in town that needed a place to congregate. They parked it right next to the barn so all of us kids played in the barn and when night fell, we all had blankets and sleeping bags and slept in the hayloft. I remember that it seemed like an exciting time, and I don't think any of us kids realized the potential impact this storm could have had on all our lives. I'm sure all the parents were having a lot of anticipatory anxiety. Nobody could really tell if the Keshequa Creek had broken through the banks since nobody could go back down the hill to find out. <clears throat> I remember Dad and some of the other men kept driving the short distance to the top of the hill to see if they could see anything, but eventually it became too dark to see down into town. The next morning we all went in cars to see what the damage was. Everyone was pleasantly surprised that the creek bank was still intact. 
However, the basements of most homes were flooded and there was a lot of debris in the lawns. Our basement had several feet of water in it and a lot of items were ruined including many 9mm reels of film containing family vacations, events, etc. My parents were very happy that our home was still standing, but we were overwhelmed with the amount of cleanup that needed to be done, especially since my sister was graduating and mom and dad had been planning her graduation party. Mostly what I remember about cleanup was all the items in the cellar had to be brought up and put outside to dry and then see what could be salvaged. Then, of course, it flows to Sanye. Now, in Sanye, it's going to meet up with the can Canisarega. This is a picture from, uh, again, it's a clipping uh, from one of the county papers of the Keshequa flowing into the Canisarega, that area. And the picture in the paper of the flats, uh, the Canisarega flats, looking like Mississippi River there. And this, although it's outside the Keshequa, is 408 going across the flats in Mount Morris. Which brings me to another thing. A lot of people talk to me from Nunday and Portage who were not directly impacted by the flood on their own homes said the most difficult thing for them for, for some time was getting to the places like work or the places that they normally went because the bridges were out, the flats were flooded, though that eventually receded. It was difficult. They had to just to go things that they're used to. And one person said, as she started driving, had gotten my gas at Rourke's Garage in Portageville, and she had no idea where she was going to buy gas after that. <laughs> And there was no gas at the super duper. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of more stories that we want to gather in. Were they going to get help? Um, and one of the things, the of course, I thought this was cute that they had was the Buffalo director for the Eternal Revenue Service announced that property losses during heavy rains and flooding may be deducted from your income tax return. <laughs> Publication 547, Tax Information and Disasters, Casualty Losses and Thefts, that you could describe. And they can, of course, you can uh, get that publication by calling or visiting your local IRS office. They're always friendly and ready to help you. <laughs> <laughs> A person who was instrumental uh, on the local level was our assemblyman Jim Emery was working hard to get federal and state funds to come in uh, and of course the American Red Cross now you see here that they were advertising all sorts of newspapers uh, and you could do it for in their headquarters for this was RK and I know there were other insurance but there were catches and I think that what will as we explore this more, and um, that's another piece of this, we want to take a look at how much did it actually cost along the Cachiqua to do the fixing. Uh, that is not readily found in the newspapers, but that's, we have a lot more to do, and we are hoping that people will help us continue to document it in our area. And there's that form again, and if you haven't picked one up or told your stories, you can. we have some in the chair in the back. And also, any memorabilia, and this is in one of the scrapbooks um, that we have from the Perry family. It was at the post office in Elmira. It was from the Northeast Dairy Cooperative Federation. It was probably a check to Kermit Perry, mm -hmm. he, and because it says pay to the order of, uh, but it went through the flood, so hopefully he got some new ones. So if you have any photographs, or know of anyone who has photographs along the Cachapois, or along the Genesee and Portageville, 
Okay, well, this brings us to our end, and I just want to go back to this quote from Millard Lee Hillis <coughs> Anderson. We can look back 50 years to the flood of 72 and find a lot of stories of people helping people, pulling together to get us through the flood of 72. Thank you very much for coming today, and if you do have any information to share with us, please do so. Okay, thank you. Yay. We hope you have enjoyed our programs on Remembering the Flood of 72. If you would like to share your own memories of the flood, you can find this form on www.nundayhistory.com. Thank you.